Okay, so without further ado, well, before we turn it over to you, I just want to just welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know, we have a lot of things that are going on and just we're, we're getting all the applications in for Sessional Consulting for those of you who are want, wanting to work with us. And so um, that what's happening there is we're going to have a panel of specialists that are going to support our women women that are our members, women at large, and any business owner. And so please, if you are interested in providing any services, any relevant services like marketing or um, uh, 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 legal services or um, setting up websites, please do keep your um, your applications in because what we're planning to do is to have a full, fully vetted board of professional of experts that are going to be able to support our women from the beginning if you know whether it's you starting up or if you want you're moving your business to the next level. So thank you so much. And now I turn it over to you, Leslie. All right, thank you. I'm just gonna load up my screen share so I can do a little PowerPoint. So hi, I'm Leslie Sultan. I'm an estate planning attorney in New York City. I'm also licensed in New Jersey. I'm also a mom. I have two kids, two girls, they're six and eight. They're back there. And I founded my law business in 2014, but I've been licensed since 2009 in New York. And as a small business owner and as a mom, I'm very invested in protecting businesses like my own and uh, helping other women and people protect their business. Um, and especially because sometimes we get really caught up in thinking about how to make our business, how to be successful, and we're not thinking about what if something were to happen to us. So that's my job as an estate planning attorney. We think about, you know, those worst case scenarios and try to help people protect, um, protect their assets, their investments and assets and businesses and families in those situations. So estate planning is a really valuable tool to protect um, businesses and families. So a little legal disclaimer, the contents of this presentation, as well as any answers discussed during any Q&A sessions are provided to you by way of general legal information only and should not be construed as legal advice for help with your specific legal situation. Please consult with a licensed attorney. Okay, so where do we start with, we think about our long-term plans, right? So what would happen to your business when you die or if you become incapacitated. So as a backup, we wanna think about what type of business do you have? You know, Are you a sole proprietor? Are you a, a partnership? Are you an LLC? Are you a corporation? These things matter because there's different outcomes and different ways to deal with the business depending on the corporate formation, the corporate structure. Um, the, and if you're an individual, it's gonna be your individual estate that has to deal with it. Um, if you're a corporation, then you're going to have to deal with, you know, shareholder agreements or partnership agreements. So the first place to look is, you know, what what type of business are you? Um, and, you know, before I get into the probate stuff, the other thing to think about is also liability, right? So I always recommend for business owners, you know, no matter what you're doing as a business, if it's just you, even if you think you're not going to make a lot of money to start or you're never going to have employees, you always want to set up some liability protection by setting up a corporation in some form or fashion. Um, speaking to an accountant is the best way to figure out what's the best um, corporate formation for you based on projected income, et cetera. Um, from a legal perspective, it doesn't really matter whether you're an LLC or an S Corp. Um, both of them provide the asset protection, the liability protection that you would need, but an accountant is a good place to start in terms of getting the recommendation for which one's the best for accounting and tax purposes. So now going back to, you know, we are all individuals, we need to know what probate is. So probate is the court process that's required to distribute or take control over someone's assets after they die. And that is with or without a will. So when there is a will, it's called the probate process. When there's no will, it's called an administration process here in New York. Uh, how long does the probate process take? So that's going to range from the based on the assets that you have. So a small estate can take just a few weeks, depending on your county. Uh, anything more than 50000 in New York is going to be a full-blown um, probate or administration, and those can take many, many months, again, depending on the county and even up to years, depending on how involved. I, as a probate attorney, 
have very, unfortunately, many cases that have been lingering for years. And it's very unfortunate because the family does not have access to the assets until it's resolved. So we've got houses just sitting there vacant. Um, we've got, you know, properties aren't able to collect rents. Um, it's very problematic. So the probate process in New York can take a very long time. Uh, it is state specific. So for example, right over there in New Jersey, the probate process is much shorter. Um, Connecticut, for example, we call it a probate friendly state. Like people just go through the probate process nice and smooth. <laughs> I don't know what that's like in New York. Um, so yes, it can be very uh, lengthy depending on your state. California is another one, very lengthy. How much does probate cost? So unfortunately it can cost a lot of money as well. So there's a, attorney fees, right? So most attorneys will charge a retainer. Uh, for example, we charge a $5,000 retainer and then we deduct an hourly rate from there. Um, but sometimes we get clients who um, don't have the $5,000 because again, they don't have access to the estate money. So then they're working out an agreement with the attorney for a percentage of the estate. Now, I don't really do those, so I can't really talk about them, but I know people that do. And I'll just give you an example. If you have a million dollar estate and an attorney agrees to take only 5%, that's $50,000 that's going to that attorney that's coming out of the estate that is not going to the children. Um, or when we've seen like risky cases, like a cousin coming in and they want to get a portion um, and the attorney's taking a risk, they'll take up to 33%, which is huge depending on the value of the estate. Um, and there's also court fees. So in New York, for example, any estate that's over 500,000, which is most estates where there's a house involved, the filing fee alone is $1,250. So that's $1,250 just to file with the court. Um, so that's, again, a lot of money. So most people say, well, I have a will. Doesn't that mean I can avoid probate? And the answer is no. A will has to be verified and acknowledged by the court. Um, a judge has to review it and stamp it and say, OK, this is a, a valid will. Why? Because obviously there's plenty of room for fraud, right? What's to stop somebody from drafting up my will, having people sign it, and then going to the bank and saying, hey, I inherited all this money. Give me my money, please. Like, no, the bank is not going to do that. Bank is going to say, take that to the court, get us a letter from the judge saying you're entitled to the money. And then again, during that probate process, business ownership cannot be transferred, bank accounts can be frozen, no bills, no vendors can be paid, no income can be re um, received. Um, basically, no one has the authority to act on behalf of the business or to access any of the accounts until someone's appointed through the courts. And then we've had situations where even once someone is appointed, a judge might have to approve a transfer or a distribution, et cetera. So now hopefully you guys have an idea of how important it is to understand the probate process. And now we're going to talk about specifically for business owners. So as I kind of mentioned, once something happens to you, the business is still a corporation, right? Or it's a, or unless it's your individual capacity, sole proprietor. Um, but now if it's dealing with a business entity, nothing can happen, right? That can't be sold. Um, you can't pay your employees. You can't get into the bank accounts, again, without court approval. A family member does not automatically have the right to step in and run your business. So unless there is an agreement where the family member is a member, a shareholder of the company, they're not going to be able to do anything until the court is appointed. Um, and when nobody's stepping up, like a family member or sometimes somebody else is petitioning, the court can appoint a non-family member as a receiver and they take over, they manage the business, they can run it, but they also charge a fee. And this can result in a in waste, a loss of income to the business. And, you know, obviously this person doesn't know the business, so they're not necessarily, you, you know, going to uphold your values in your business. And again, if the business owns property, so if you're an investor, you have real estate, you have rental income, um, you can't collect rent from the tenants until someone's uh, appointed, the business can't be, the property cannot be refinanced, right? So now you've got a foreclosure potentially happening, a loan cannot be modified unless there's a court order or another member of the business who has the authority to do it. So it can be, I mean, it can damage and destroy your business, right? So you you put in all this time and effort, you've got this business going, you really want to think about how to protect it. 
So next question, how do I protect my business and avoid this from happening? So step one is you're going to want to look at your operating agreements. So if you have set up a corporation or an LLC, most likely you did it through an online service or an accountant, and you, maybe you got a binder, <laughs> and you probably never read any of the documents in there. You just know you've got your corporate ID number and your seal. But those documents probably have some language about what happens when a member or a shareholder dies. So you want to look and read that. And if you like what it says, okay, that's great. Um, but probably you don't like what it says because it's those um, the templates are generally written in favor of the surviving member. So it'll say that the um, surviving partner or the surviving member can buy out the um, uh, estate of the deceased member at um, at a price based on their own evaluation. I mean, something very vague like that, which you know, is not ideal because obviously they're going to value it low to get the best price <laughs> and to buy out the family. Um, we've seen some really nightmare situations with partnerships that or uh, companies that um, they did not have the right operating agreement in place and the remaining, you know, living member um, brought on someone else, just basically splurged all the money in like trying to rebuild it and there was nothing left for the spouse of the deceased business owner. Um, really, really terrible stuff. So, um, you know, again, the first place you want to look at is your operating agreement. If you don't like what it says, you do want to revise it. And you can speak with an attorney, usually business lawyers do this, um, or some estate planning attorneys can give, you know, provide updated language that addresses, you know, what you and your partners or colleagues or whatever agree upon. Or even if it's just you, you know, what you want to happen. How do you want your family to take over? Um, but unfortunately, with a business plan, even with an operating agreement, you could still wind up in probate, right? Because of, the agreement is only enforceable through the estate. And the estate, again, has to go through probate. The other option and or complementary approach is to do a revocable trust. So what that means is you would create a trust with an estate planning attorney, ideally, and you would transfer the ownership of the business to the trust. Now you can be the trustee of your trust. So in all formality purposes, you still control that business. But by the trust owning it and you being the trustee, A, you can avoid probate because a trust is a legal contract that allows you as the trustee to manage your assets and then distribute them according to your wishes. There's no court involvement. It's a legal document that avoids the court. It's a really valuable tool. So essentially, again, you're going to transfer your business ownership into the trust, or if you're a sole proprietor, you're just going to mention my trust is in the, uh, my business goes into the trust. You continue to maintain control. So you're still writing the checks. You can still pay people. You can still receive income. And the trust stays with the trust controls everything while you're alive. And then upon your death, you can say what would happen. Um, and or, you know, it can say the trustee is, re is um, authorized to sell the business and distribute the proceeds to my children or to my siblings, whatever it is. The successor trustee, the person who comes after you, does not need to go through the court process. It's just written in the document. I'm the first trustee. Successor trustee is my best friend, and she's going to step in and do everything I need her to do for the business. No court involvement. So it's a very valuable tool. Um, people are doing it all the time. The history around trust is basically, you know, the super uber rich uh, got together with their attorneys and were like, help me figure out <laughs> how to avoid taxes and how to avoid court process. And the, and the, back in the days, the Vanderbilts, et cetera, they, their attorneys came up with the trust. And over time, they were challenged in the courts and with the IRS. And now we, as you know, the little small business owners can take advantage of these valuable tools. So a little analogy of how you can think about a trust. So a trust is like a red wagon. There's no probate court for the business and the assets that you put into the trust. And then, you you know, the lady, the girl's holding her little handle and she's in control of it. She can take them wherever she wants. She can take things out, put things in, et cetera. The main thing is that you have to fund the trust. So you have to put the assets into the trust or into the wagon. So whatever didn't get put into the trust 
will have to go through probate. So it's really important if you're doing estate planning, you know, to work with your estate planning attorney and make sure that everything is going into the trust and nothing's left out. Because unfortunately we do see situations where people set up a trust and then they don't put the assets in there. So then it's a contract that controls nothing and that's not helpful to anybody. I have, I have a question. Sure. Um, I, you're talking about revocable trust. I know yes. That. Do you ever have the case where there is an irrevocable trust? With, yeah. With the setting? And, and if you could just give an example of, of why would someone elect to do irrevocable as opposed to revocable? Sure. In, so, in, a, business, in a business context. Um, I don't see them too often in an irrevocable trust because um, the irrevocable trust offers asset protect additional asset protection. Um, but the reason it is able to do that is because the owner is giving up control of the assets. So when I set up an irrevocable trust, I, Leslie Sultan, put my business in there and then I appoint a net to be my trustee, I no longer have control of those assets. Now, Annette has a fiduciary duty to manage them for my benefit and according to my wishes, but depending on you know, the circumstances, you know, most people don't want to appoint somebody else to manage their business for them. Now, when I do see it, um, for example, I have clients who are own several properties, their husband and wife, and they're older and they're retired, and they're just collecting that income. And so they are also looking at Medicaid planning, right? They don't want assets in their name because they want to be able to qualify for Medicaid if they need it. So they have to get the assets out of their name, but they appointed each other. So they can kind of oversee and manage and they trust their spouse to control the assets for them. So in that situation, again, it's the same dynamic. They had um, LLCs. We transferred the membership certificates out of their individual names into their trust in, uh, that's ma now managed by the spouse. And then we set up instructions for that. So it is a good tool for additional asset protection. Um, sometimes we also see it for people who have high liability risks. So I don't know about in business generally, but for example, emergency room doctors, right? They are always uh, at risk of being sued. So they have a high liability there's only so much that their um, malpractice insurance is going to cover. And so they're always concerned about what if someone sues me and there's additional liability beyond my coverage, can they come after my assets? And the answer is yes. So they'll put their assets into an irrevocable trust. But again, they have to be okay with somebody else controlling those assets for them. And not every family has that. I'm sorry, Annette, you're muted. There are a couple more comments and, and stuff, so I'll just give it to you real quickly. Um, a question is saying, isn't it important to have uh, key main insurance, key man insurance in case this happens? I'm not sure mm -hmm. what that means. That's one question. And then the next question is, should we prepare a living trust will? Okay. So thanks. Those are great questions, guys. So key man insurance is basically life insurance that the business can get for the main person, right? So if I'm, you know, the principal of my business, my law practice, um, my partners can put, uh, get key man insurance for me. And so if I die there, the, they'll, the money will come to them or to the business as a life insurance policy, right? Which most people understand. Um, so yeah, that's a really good tool. Um, but again, it doesn't, it doesn't resolve the business, like who's going to take over the control or the shares, so a key man policy is great, but you still want to look at the bigger picture of is the corporation or the business set up properly to handle my death. Um, now the you said a living will trust. Is that what the, what was that the second question? It says, should we prepare a living trust slash will? Okay. So a living will is what another another phrase for what I've been talking about, which is the revocable trust. I'm sorry, the revo <laughs> there's a lot of terms and they get mixed up a lot. A revocable living trust is the term that I'm speaking about when I'm talking about a trust. Um, a last will and testament is the common, is the legal name for the common term of a will. Um, so a will, as I said, requires probate. And to be honest, every time we set up a trust, we also set up what's called a pour over will, 
which says that if anything didn't get put into the trust, so just like the red wagon, if I didn't put something in that trust, in that wagon, and it's left out, I do create also a will for people that says, if anything didn't get put into the wet trust, I want it to be moved into the trust after I'm dead. So there always is a pour over will, last will and testament that goes with the trust. To be clear, a living will is a healthcare document. It's an advanced healthcare directive that basically says, in the event that I am in a vegetative state that's irreversible and there's no likely chance that I'm coming back, do I or don't I want to be on life support? Um, so um, I hear these questions um, and, and these terms get mixed up a lot, unfortunately. So I'm not 100% sure which the um, questioner is asking about, um, but so at least we can break down the different terms. Um, but again, ideally, if you're doing estate planning, you're doing all of those. So you're going to do your trust, you're going to do your pour over will, you're going to do all your healthcare documents to make sure somebody's appointed to make healthcare decisions for you. And you're going to do a power of attorney in case you become incapacitated, but you're still alive. So somebody can manage your assets while you're alive. <laughs> um, and yeah, so that's the basic um, parts of an estate plan. And we recommend doing all of them <laughs> at the same time. And so, uh, it's just the, the, the question, the person who question said, thanks for the clarity. <laughs> okay, sure. No problem. It's very common and we get it all the time. So I understand. Um, so I guess I'll go back to the slides and then if people have more questions, I'll take them. So another question we get a lot is what about taxes? If I set up a trust, um, don't I have to pay a higher taxes? So um, going back to the trust, so a revocable living trust, you manage your assets. Um, you have to transfer assets into the trust, but you still have control over them. So you still sign the checks. So technically you are, I don't know why my thing has question marks on it. It's, it's reported, the income tax to the trust is reported on your personal side. So, or your business side. So whoever, if your business has income and you put it into a trust, the trust reports the business income. Um, but it is sometimes taxed uh, at a higher level, the tax to the trust. So it's something you wanna speak to an accountant about because I've talked to different accountants about this. Some accountants have ways of, you know, do, of working out the numbers. So there's, there's no significant tax difference. Um, so the main thing I would recommend if you're concerned about taxes for your business is speak to an accountant who's familiar with trusts and not all of them are. Um, so, you know, when you do an estate plan, see if your estate planning attorney can make a recommendation for an accountant that's familiar with it, because again, not all are, unfortunately, I've seen situations where accountants set up trust for, <laughs> for clients and it becomes kind of a nightmare. So, um, but anyways, there are specific forms that just basically get attached to either the personal return or the business return that acknowledges the trust as the entity, uh, so to speak, of owning the assets. But generally, it's taxed at the same level as the original ownership interest. Um, and then the next thing to point out is that once you set up a trust, you want to update it or at least have it reviewed periodically. So, for example... Um, right now, my kids are six and eight. I don't plan on having any more kids, but at some point, they're going to hopefully, you know, become adults and go off to college. I might want to reconsider what I have in my trust. So uh, going back and, and having it evaluated and updated because ch things change is really important. Um, the main reasons we want to change a trust is when there's a divorce, uh, when there's new children or grandchildren, if you move out of state. Or if you acquire, um, you know, you might inherit something and you want to make sure it's protected um, or you become, you know, your business becomes really successful and you want to make sure it's protected. So, um, yeah, and unfortunately, we've seen uh, ugly situations where in divorces, people are coming after the money and they're going to come after the business. So, um, you know, really planning to protect the business and the income uh, through the estate planning. Um, the next thing I do want to talk a little bit about, about a power of attorney. I mentioned it earlier, and it's really important, again, because estate planning generally deals with uh, after you pass away. But we have a lot of situations where someone becomes incapacitated, right? Someone could fall and hit their head and lose capacity, um, strokes, 
dementia, all of that stuff. So a power of attorney is a really valuable tool to appoint somebody to make legal and financial decisions while you're alive. It's a really powerful tool. Don't want to give it to just anybody. Um, but that allows somebody else to uh, take over the business. It allows them to access your bank accounts. It allows them to make you know those decisions for you. It can happen. It can help if you're out of state or out of country and you get stuck there, right? So during COVID, we saw the borders were shut down. People were out of, got locked out of the country. Um, a power of attorney could have helped them and their agent could have gone and done conducted business for them here in the States. Uh, and obviously the mental incapacitations. Um, so that's a power of attorney. If someone does not have a power of attorney and, and something happens to them, a court appointment of a guardian has to take place. And this sucks, okay? Because the family now has to a, hire an attorney, uh, have someone appointed as a guardian, go through again a whole court process. Uh, they have to send evaluators, write reports. It's very um, time consuming and expensive and it can be easily resolved by simply doing a power of attorney. I mean, it's amazing because you, it, you know, a couple hundred dollars for a power of attorney versus thousands of dollars for a guardianship proceeding. So that's pretty much the end of my script here. Um, I do always like to remind people if you're a parent, you know, have you thought about guardianship for your kids? You know, who would be raising your children if something were to happen to you? Um, do you have appointed guardians long-term and temporary, right? So my long-term guardian lives in Canada. So if something were to happen to me, she's not gonna just be able to come down from Canada and go pick up my kids from school. So I have to nominate individuals that are local that can go pick them up from school and have the legal authority to do so. Um, and also, you know, think about your parents, right? So if your parents are retiring, if they're getting older, do they have an estate plan? Because if they don't, you're the one that's going to have to deal with all of the mess, um, you know, afterwards if they didn't take care of it. So one of the things we say about estate planning is it really is a gift that you give your family, especially if you're doing a trust because you take care of everything, you put it into this nice little wagon and deliver it to them all tidy with a bow. So um, that's my, you know, estate planning for business owners. Here's my contact information and I'll take any more questions. Yeah. Um, so I have a question um, to ask you. So if you own, there's several people who have the, their, their, their primary residence and they may own a couple more uh, company, company um, properties. Do you recommend that they um, form a corporation to, uh, instead of owning it outright as an individual? Oh, yes, absolutely. So the primary residents can be in their own name and there's benefits to doing that, right? Because you can get the star exemption in New York and get discounts for your homestead, basically. Um, and it's easier to get a mortgage or refinance. Anytime there's a property being owned, um, for investment, like rental purposes, you definitely want to have as much liability protection as possible because tenants are a liability, <laughs> okay? Um, any one of those tenants and any one of their family members or guests that can come in and get hurt are going to sue the homeowner. And if the homeowner is you individually, they're going to come after you and all of the assets in your name. If you set up a corporation, we generally it's an LLC in New York, the LLC owns that building and only the LLC can be sued. Now, if there's three buildings, do you wanna own one LLC and that one LLC owns three buildings? No, for the same reason. Because if there's three buildings and they sue the one LLC, they can go after all three of the properties. So although it costs a little bit of money for each LLC and depending, you know, it can be thousands of dollars with the publication costs, um, it's highly recommended to set up one corporation for each property to again give you that asset protection for each property wow i've never heard that advice that's it's you know that's that's very interesting oh wow and, and, I, and I i know that sometimes people own business so sometimes people own property and they don't really manage it as a business so taking it the next level then they should probably also set up a, a trust right a revocable trust. right exactly yeah so basically one you know if when I, I have a few clients that do this, so I'll, I'll see their portfolio and it'll be like four houses all owned in the individual's name. It's like, oh my gosh. So there is a, you know, in addition to setting up the LLC, you also need to do a deed transfer. 
So it has to come out of your name into the uh, corporate name. But once it's in the LLC, we can just do a transfer internally of the membership shares to the trust. So um, whereas if you're transferring from mom to child and then child to trust, that's two deeds and that's you know more expensive. Um, oh, and the other thing I want to mention, because we've had cases where contractors go to the house and they do repairs and we had a contractor fall, the contractor employed someone, that person fell in like permanent paralysis and sued the homeowner for like $2 million, right? And the insurance didn't cover that much. So, uh, you know, I wasn't involved in like the litigation part of the injury, but I did see the $2 million judgment against the homeowner. Now, luckily, the homeowner was an LLC. And right after this incident happened, they sold the LLC and dissolved it. So now there's attorneys calling, trying to figure out, you know, where did the money go? And that's a much harder way to find the money. But if that individual owned the house in their individual name when that person fell, they would have a lot more problems. You can't just get rid of all your assets so quickly that are in your name. So... Yeah, there's a lot of reasons to put income generating properties into a corporation. So thank you so much, Leslie. Uh, you know, our time has expired, but we did talk about this being the beginning of a series. Yes. <laughs> so much information. You know, when, when when I invited you, you were like, well, what do you want me to talk about? You want me to talk about this <laughs> that? You know, so we're going to put together a series. And so look, you know, um, we look forward to being able to continue to having having these discussions. Another question was, do you, do you, um, are you able to help people out, work with people outside of New York state? That's um, yeah, so we do, um, what we can do is you can contact us and let us know what state you're in. And we would try to find, um, an attorney in your state that, um, can help you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Leslie. And again, you know, we, what sister now is about checking with your sister first. And so we're so happy that we have you among us. And this is so important. So many of us as women, we're so busy with so many things that we don't take the time to do this type of planning, whether it be life insurance, whether it be, you know, um, well, life insurance is, is also part of estate planning, but just, just different things, even about the children. You know, um, I have several children. <laughs> and if, if, if I do have a will and I did name who, I would like to take care of my children and that has kind of changed and my children are growing up now, but um, if just the last thing in closing, if you could just talk about more about that. I mean, is it enough to say, I want, you know, John Doe or Jane Doe to take care of my children in the, you know, when I die? How does yeah, that well, I, I think one of the other sessions will be more elaborate on um, estate planning for parents of, of children, especially minor children, because the first thing most people don't realize is that minor children cannot inherit. So, um, for example, I had a situation where grandma had life insurance. She named all her grandchildren. One of them was 14. So when she died, the 14-year-old could not receive his payout. And mom, the 14-year-old's mother, had to file a petition with the court to be appointed the guardian of his estate. And she spent tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees doing this. And when that happened, the court had her put it into a very conservative savings account, no interest bearing, right? <laughs> Which, ah, and <laughs> then when he turned 18, he had a petition for it to be released. It wasn't automatic. And not every parent likes the idea of a child at 18 potentially receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars. So a will isn't always enough because, um, you know, A, the child, the child, it means the children are going to inherit right when they turn 18. Um, a guardian has to be appointed if they're minors. And, you know, we don't necessarily ne have control over who that guardian is unless we do some kind of estate planning. So, you know, will will work. <laughs> Absolutely. And you can appoint somebody. But again, that person has to go through the probate process with the will. So, you know, hopefully there's money available to them to pay for an attorney and pay the filing fees for that. Um, and then, you know, unless you set it up differently, it's usually an outright distribution at 18. So now, you know, your kids who don't have a mother anymore are potentially receiving lots of money without the wherewithal that we have of what the risks are and spending it and not saving it and learning how to manage money properly. So we always recommend doing something like a, a spread out distribution. So a portion at 25, another portion at 30, and the balance at 35. 
I don't know. If yeah, I'll tell the story at the next session. So you <laughs> okay. gotta come to that one, especially when Granny is expecting that grandchild to go to college and become, you know, a scientist or something. <laughs> Yeah, thank yeah. You so much, Leslie, um, Stephanie yeah. says, you know, thank you. And uh, it's been very informative. I agree. And we're going to talk to you. Um, so because it's important that we make sure that all of our sisters are informed. So, yes. So much and have a great evening. everyone. <laughs> thank you for having me. It's been an honor. I appreciate it.